Heavenly Father, we are here. You, the God of all life, we thank you. We thank you for a place to be. We thank you for families that gather. We thank you for friends. We thank you for your presence. And Lord, we praise you. We praise you for the wisdom that you provide. We praise you for your care. We praise you for the sunlight in our spirits. We praise you for the hands on our blinded eyes. Lord, continue in this hour to touch us, to be with us. Reach out to us with compassion and forgiveness, especially after another week of, of loss for many of us. Reach out to us so that we might know and receive your gifts, that we might know and celebrate your love and your grace, that we might remember on this memorial weekend, and that we might rise to new life in Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Welcome to this place. Welcome all of you who regularly gather here. Welcome to all the visiting faces as you gather here because you're gathering with family. We also welcome those that uh, are receiving many of our members uh, out because they're traveling to visit family as well. And we welcome those listening to us on, uh, on video. You are welcome here. It's a time to, this weekend especially, remember, remember the good things that God has done. As someone has once said, those who don't remember have no God. We are a people of memory, and what a story we have to tell. Let's stand and invite someone here, and then we'll remain standing and sing to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us a son. This is a song where you are recounting God's salvation history. You are remembering. And what a thing to remember. To God be the glory.
may be seated. As we think of that promise, that great thing that he has done, we together will read the scripture from 2 Corinthians. You can go to 853 and your hymnal worship books or it's up there. And you, we will read this together because this is really the promise of what happens to us when we accept what we just sang about. You will read the, uh, what's on the screen up there, the, the yellow italics, and I will read the white regular print. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21, you begin. If anyone... All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses and their sins, their wrongdoings against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. that we might become the righteousness of God. Today, the songs, many of the songs that we're going to be singing have been chosen by our residents that live in Pleasant View Home or in Sunshine Home, and I think they fit well with the service. As we think of what we've just sung, firstly, and then what we just uh, read together in 2 Corinthians, a song of celebration, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 6.
as the gifts of God are brought forward, you may remain seated, but let's raise our voices. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When we sing that song every Sunday, it reminds me of the diversity of the church, and that is pretty much we sing it in a different key every Sunday. <laughs> and that's my fault. But hey, we're going to have the keys covered by the time. This week, this week, we celebrate in the church what's called Ascension Day. Ascension Day is actually, was actually Thursday, was the, the, holy, the holy day during the week. Uh, in our tradition, we don't take that off anymore. We used to in the Mennonite church. We, we don't anymore. But there's a story behind it because it reminds us of the cycles. Just as Christmas reminds us of Christ's birth, just as Palm Sunday reminded us of a certain thing, and then Holy Week reminded us, and then Easter reminded us, so does Ascension Day remind us that Christ, the risen Christ, now ascends to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. Next week, we celebrate another high holy day, and that's Pentecost, when the giving of the Holy Spirit is given. And in your bulletins, you see uh, it written, as many people talk about it, as the birthday of the church, of the church universal. Um, and we're, we're going to celebrate communion next Sunday in, in celebration of the giving of the Holy Spirit. But before that, this happens. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 2. Until the day that Jesus was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, and after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them for a period of 40 days. So Jesus, after his resurrection, was on earth for 40 more days, teaching and, and appearing and speaking and inspiring. And in these 40 days, he spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this commandment, this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promises, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Will this be your second coming, is often the question. And he said to them, No, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after Jesus had said this, he was taken up before their eyes. He ascended, ascension. He ascended before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And they were looking so intently up in the sky as he was going, when, the, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood behind them, beside them and said, Men of Galilee. I almost imagine if they're all standing there like this. All of a sudden they feel a tap on their shoulder. Hey, hey, hey. Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking up in the sky? Meaning, come on, you're wasting time. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Ascension Day. That is what we celebrate as we prepare for Pentecost. And it's fitting then also that uh, we sing this next song, Wilbur Neufeld's favorite song, When Peace Like a River, uh, for several reasons. One is, for sure, that is that not only is Christ risen, but God has accepted him. They sit, God and Jesus are one, but they sit on the throne together. Our Jesus, our risen Lord, has the power of God's throne and is in heaven. And so, as we think about everything that's happened in the last week, of how many funerals 
Have we been together, especially with our school teachers? Have we been together? As we think about all the things this world brings, as we think about our future, may the words we sing truly be comfort for the power of Christ in our lives. When peace like a river attendeth my way. We're going to sing verse 2 a cappella.
Heavenly Father, you are in this place through singing and through scripture and now through your word spoken and proclaimed. Open our ears to hear. Open my mouth to speak. I pray for your inspiration. Amen. All right, I need some help this morning. Who am I supposed to preach about again? Jonah. Jonah. <laughs> I love those voices. Some are like, Jonah. 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 <laughs> Hannah's like, Jonah, just get it over with, Wilmer. Let's go. <laughs> All right, where did we leave Jonah? Well, I think last week, if you didn't get the point driven home, I'll do it again right now, the whale was not Jonah's biggest problem, right? The whale was not Jonah's biggest problem. We found out that Jonah was probably an example, more of an example of what not to be than what to be. In fact, we're challenged, at least we were challenged last week, and I think this, this entire book of Jonah challenges us to essentially not be like Jonah, whose problem was that he loved to preach God's judgment, but then became extremely judgmental with God's love when God's love extended even to his enemies, the Ninevites. All right, today I want us to backtrack just a little bit. We took a very big picture view of, of Jonah last week. Today I want to, I want, and, and next week, I want to I wanna sort of focus down on some of the particulars that, that come out of, out of the book of Jonah. So if you would turn to Jonah chapter 3 with me. Jonah chapter 3. As you're looking about it, let me give some background. Jonah chapter 3 comes right after Jonah has, and this is the part of the story we're probably most familiar with, Jonah has disobeyed God. God called him very clearly, go to Nineveh and preach. And <laughs> Job, uh, Job, Jonah goes the absolute opposite. He gets on a ship, and then there's a storm. They try to figure out what's going on, and finally they figure out Jonah's the problem. They throw him overboard. The storm calms. A uh, big fish comes, swallows Jonah up for three days and three nights. Jonah, and, and one of the most powerful prayers you'll see, which is actually part of it is posted on the front of your bulletins, prays to the Lord, and the whale spews, I'll use that word, I was critiqued for using puked too much last uh, <laughs> Sunday, but that's what it is in the Hebrew. There's no mincing it. Out onto the beach, and that's where we find Jonah today back on solid ground. He's still alive, and he's got to be quite amazed that he's still alive. So, Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city, and a visit required three days. That's interesting, and some of your translations said it was such a big day, such a big city that it took three days to cross. So maybe you could say, to see all the sites, you had to be there at least three days, sort of like visiting the Smithsonian. On the first day, Jonah started into the city, and he proclaimed, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in dust. And then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. So you ranchers, you've got to keep your cattle from eating and drinking. But let men man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not all perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. Or as some of your uh, scriptures say, some of your translations say, because you can pick this out of the Hebrew as well, that is, God changed his mind out of mercy. And he did not bring upon them the destruction that had been threatened. There you have it. Jonah has been 
evacuated out onto the beach. And he now comes to his senses. His eyes have to acclimate to the brightness. The word of the Lord all of a sudden is right back onto him. And I want you to notice something that's described in verse 1, because I think this is absolutely, or verse 1 of, of this chapter, because it's absolutely key to unlocking all of, of Jonah, which we were working at before, uh, last Sunday as well. Verse 1 purposely emphasizes, purposely emphasizes that what God says now to Jonah is not the first time God said it. In fact, if you look at the original command at the beginning of, of Jonah, of what God gave in the first place, it's almost the same thing. It's almost the same thing. Why is that important? God gives a second chance. God gives a second chance. This book is filled with grace and mercy and, and unmerited gifts. God should have just left Jonah in the whale. Yet it says, for a second time, God gives the same message to God. That gives me hope, at least, for my life. It's kind of like when your parents said, I'm only going to tell you once. Okay? You had better obey or else. And then if you tested it, they said, well, okay, but this time I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not saying God is wishy-washy here, but it's amazing how God says, okay, my plans are for love and for grace. I will be flexible within that. It isn't the need to stick to my whatever. The need is to stick to my grace and my love for even the Ninevites and disobedient Jonah. And so, fortunately, Jonah doesn't test it any further. He doesn't say, well, I wonder if I can get away with it, and he'll tell me a third time. On the second try, Jonah obeys. The word of the Lord in the second time is repeated. The first, Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. The biggest, he doesn't say this in the Bible, but this is what we know from studying. It's the biggest, baddest, sinfulest, worldliest, violentest, whatever is city that you can think of, that city your parents told you never to go visit. He's sending Jonah to go there and proclaim the message I tell you. So given a second chance, Jonah goes into this city and he goes to Nineveh and he arrives and he walks in a day's walk into the city and uh, he preaches. He preaches. Now here's the interesting, interesting thing about Jonah. He might be obedient to God the second time, but that doesn't mean he has to be excited about it. I was once, uh, there was once a composer by the name of Shostakovich, and he was in the Soviet Union. And uh, he was, uh, the Soviet Union wanted to send Shostakovich and, and uh, some of these, uh, Rinsky Korsakov, some of these other guys, I don't know if Rinsky Korsakov, one of those guys, out, uh, together out to the U.S. to show them the, 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 the good music. And uh, uh, he didn't want to go. And so, but they said, no, you're going to go, or else you're going to uh, pay for it in the gulag. He says, well, I can go, but you can't make me enjoy it. And they said at every meeting, he sat like this and refused to say anything. Well, he was obeying technically the word of the Soviets, but they couldn't make him enjoy it. That's Jonah today. Yes, I'll go preach, but you can't make me appreciate the message that I'm preaching. So he goes in and he gives an unspectacular sermon. Now, most of you would think this is the way sermons should be preached. It's only five words long. <laughs> but there's no, I mean, if he preached this in sermon school, he'd get kicked out. I mean, there's just nothing to it, really. He preaches five words. He goes in there, you can almost say, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Although he might have put some emphasis into it because he liked the judgment part. That's all he preaches. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And for those of you who are counting those words, it's Hebrew. Five words in Hebrew, not English. <laughs> I can hear you already. <laughs> in Low German, it's also five words. No. <laughs> so, five words. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. He doesn't even tell them what to do. 
He, d- he, does, he does nothing more. There's no conclusion. There's no body. There's not even a video to it or PowerPoint. No, there's not one today either. <laughs> not many details are given. Where are the three points? But it does warn the people of Nineveh of impending judgment by God. Now, even though what seems to be a half-hearted attempt at preaching, mediocre at best, the Spirit of God stirs deeply, and people respond. That's the nugget I want to work with. Look at what happens with even the most mediocre attempt. God's way and power and glory is still received. The Spirit of God stirs deeply and the people respond to a lame five-word sermon. That brings up three observations today, and and there's a sermon guide if you need to follow along in in the bulletin since I didn't have a PowerPoint up. I want to give you three observations about that because I think it touches our lives and our reality as we think about ourselves as ministering people, as we think about ourselves as faithful people, as we think about the world and how God works or doesn't work or how things get done. The first observation is this. Our job is to be faithful and to leave the results to God. Often, if you get into ethics courses, it's called faithfulness versus effectiveness. Our job is to be, first and foremost, faithful and leave the effectiveness to God. And you can apply this to a wide range of of events in our lives. As Christians, all of us are called to be messengers of God. I do not kid you. I do not try to waste your money by printing at the top of the bulletins that I am your lead pastor, that Jenny Schrag is your youth pastor, but all of you are ministers. That's not there just to look funny and gimmicky. That is there to remind you all of us are called to be messengers of Jesus Christ. All of us are called to speak the good news. All of us are called to live the good news. We are called first and foremost then though to be faithful. Now some of you are already saying, I can't speak a lick. I, I, I'm, I'm the worst person to be an, exa- uh, an example to. But think of Jonah. We are called to be faithful. We are called to put ourselves out there. We are called to put out our gifts, our time, or whatever out there. That is the action of faithfulness. Then God lays on top of that effectiveness as God sees fit for the moment. Now sometimes our faithfulness calls us to do things that don't seem effective or even reasonable. Now I'm not saying that we are called to be not reasonable. God gave us brains to think things through. But think about what Jesus did for you and what he did for me. If someone told you, or if someone, and and Jesus did this, he told him his plan for salvation, and what did people do? It was so silly of a plan, so ineffective, you're going to die for victory out of love, and you'll win? What happened to defending yourself? What happened to having the bigger gun or the bigger sword and beating the crap out of your enemy? That's the way you get things done. And Jesus said, no, I will sacrifice myself and you will follow me in the same way. That's not effective. It seems to be not effective until God pulls the rug out and the tomb is empty. Now, if we are Christians and if we believe that Christ is our center and that Christ is our Lord, then the way Christ does it is our way as well. And Christ's faith is our faith as well. So when God calls us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of loving and being compassionate and being hospitable, do we have a model of effectiveness? And the answer is yes. The resurrection, the ascension, the Pentecost, all of God working. And God's call in our life, as it is to Jonah, is it's not up to you to ultimately 
change the world. Jonah, all I need you to do is go over there, present yourself, and say something. I will do the work. Now think how releasing that is for you as a Sunday school teacher, for you as a board member, for you as a minister in the work wherever you're at, whether you're working, uh, wherever you're working out in the world. You as a minister. You don't have to know Greek or Hebrew or Plotich even. You just have to. You just have to be able to put yourself out there in the name of Christ. And God is effective through you as he was with Jonah. Jonah is actually serving as a positive example right now. Jonah obeys God in warning the Ninevites, even though he disagrees, even though he dislikes them, he outrightly hates them. In fact, he wants them to be destroyed. Remember, that's why he went to Tarshish. He knew God would be merciful. But Jonah still does it, and God works deeply. And I think we can trust God then to use our weak and feeble and often misplaced words to bring good news. How many times have we said, I, I didn't even go visit that person, I didn't know what to say. That's not the point. Nothing you're ever going to say would probably help a person in deep grief, but the fact that you went and were present, you were the very arms and hope of God in that moment. You made a difference. Put yourself in places, no matter what excuse you have for not doing it well. God will work through you. And if you don't believe me, just read the Bible. Read about the disciples. Read about the Apostle Paul. Read about every single person in the Bible who probably had good and valid excuses. Moses uses four excuses. I can't talk. I stumble. I mumble. They won't believe me. La, 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 la. And God finally says, who gave you your tongue to talk? I did. Use it in my name. God works in mysterious and creative ways. Our job is to be faithful, to put ourselves in the situations of ministry, and God will faithfully empower us to give results. Observation one. Now, after God, God's words of warning through Jonah are preached, the entire city, and again, the animals, and I said, I'm just intrigued. At every corner, it's not just the people, it's all of the animals, everybody. And not just that they have to fast, but they're supposed to put sackcloths on the, all the animals. I'm guessing there's quite a few of them there. Um, they repent. They fast. They wear sackcloths. That's the ancient sign of humility and grief and, and repentance. And they do change their ways, at least for the time being. And the word spreads, cr spreads quickly, and it reaches the king of Nineveh, who makes it official by making it some sort of a day of national repentance. And that leads to observation number two, and that's this. Repentance occurs in our lives when we see God for who God is. See, the Ninevites didn't have a category for the one true God, at least not until Jonah came and put himself in the place to present it and warn them of coming destruction. Now, my guess is, and we don't have this recorded, but... Jonah, there were probably some follow-up questions to his sermon. I'm sure they engaged him and said, now wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? What are you talking about? Whatever, whatever. I'm sure there was a little bit of that going on as well. We don't have a record of that. In a similar way, we don't often know what, that we're living in sin or going in the wrong direction until the Word of God confronts us, until it convicts us, until... Things come to light that we are reminded, no, it's time to repent. And repent means to do that thing that we can't do in Bueller, and that's do a U-turn. It means come right back, head back to where you're going from. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you can say now, yeah, the preacher said you can do U-turns. You're supposed to do U-turns. No, you're supposed to turn around and go, go directly back. You're, you're traveling in the wrong direction. Turn around and go back. That's what repent means. It's amazing how when we read and reread Scripture, new things come to light. And we're reminded of things. And I think it's probably, it's probably the hardest for people like most of us to repent. That's because we think we know it all already. Or we have so many layers of, of, of Sunday school teaching and this and that, which is all good. But it makes it awfully difficult to realize that maybe some of these are pointing to us. But it's 
very important that we are constantly immersing ourselves back into even the familiar because it's in those moments, especially when we do it in community, that all of a sudden we realize we might not know it all. And it might convict us in ways that we have never understood before. Like when Jesus said, love your enemies, he meant it. It's in there. That's not just gravy to our Varenica for the Mennonites. It is the center of the gospel. That when Jesus does the hard teachings he does on the Sermon on the Mount, it's at the center of how God works. And how often have I at least gone back to that and said, oh, wow. Wow. I've been doing it wrong. I need more humility. I need more direction in this way. Now, often we're like the Ninevites who are described by God as not even knowing their right hand from their left hand. That's a a, a way the Bible often talks about being clueless. Someone doesn't even know their right hand from their left hand. The Ninevites are described as that in today's passage. And I think our relationship with God is often hindered by having a small view of God. A small view. And, and often that comes in thinking we know our right hand from our left hand, but we don't. We have such a narrow view of God, and we have such a narrow view even of, of what it means to be sin, uh, sinners. And I don't mean to be, to be judgmental here, but the point is, sinning is any time we break relationship with God's way, or think that we are God's in and of ourselves, or we make God's out of other things. And a small view of God can lead us down two different paths. One is a depressed state where we live in constant guilt and fear that we're not doing it right and, and, and those sort of things. And we see no hope in all of this. Like, like why would we follow God if uh, there's just this pressure and we're always getting it wrong? And the other way in the midst of, of, of realizing our sin is a state of doing whatever just feels good. That's our reasoning for understanding who God is. We do what feels good. If it feels good, it it must be good. And I think the Ninevites had a small view of God. They did. They, they didn't understand the, the, the God as he's revealed in Scripture. They had, didn't understand that. They didn't understand the, the consequences of their sin. And their sin is named as this, violence and evil. It's interesting how often violence, if you go back, if, if I asked our, our catechism class this, tell me what was the sin that, that God became disappointed with the people in that he sent the flood. What's the sin that's named? It's violence. It's violence. God abhors violence. And same thing here in Nineveh. And yet when the word of God comes through Jonah, they become aware that God is big. They, they, their, their picture expands. So it is with us. We need to put ourselves in places where our picture of God expands. That's why you come and sit and listen to a preacher who loves to talk at length on things. Because you might just expand. Think of it as arteries. How many of us have dealt with clogged arteries? Probably quite a few of us here. What do they do when you have clogged arteries? They balloon it or they put a stint in here. Think about the times that you meet for study. Whether you, whether you already think you know it all or not, we meet to study and to pray so that we can balloon our arteries. We stretch our arteries so that more sustenance can come through. It's a discipline. All of us are there and need to be there. Studying, reading, knowing, memorizing. One of the greatest curses in the U.S. is that about 80, in polls, 80% 80 of the people say we should follow the Bible. The Bible is central to our lives. And yet when the question is asked, how many of you have read the Bible in the last month or in the last week, it falls to below 40%. Where's the disconnect? What, what's happening? I think it is we think we know what God is. We think we've got it all figured out, and we rely on those thoughts, and we don't feed ourselves new things. We don't take the time to digest good amounts within the community of God's Word. That leads to observation three. Well, one of the things I'd go back for observation two is that repentance then occurs 
our ability to do a proper U-turn occurs when we really see who God is. We see God for who God is, not for who we think or we want God to be, but for who God really is. That's when we go, oh no, I do need to make this turn. All right, observation three. Understanding and celebrating God's grace begins with understanding our shortcomings, our sin. Good news keeps in balance two truths. One is this. We as human beings have broken our relationship with God worse than we can ever imagine. But we are more loved than we can ever dream of. All of us. The fact is, all of us are sinners. All of us are. And as I've said before, if you're sitting there going, no, I'm not, that's your sin. It's called self-righteousness. And Jesus has a lot to say about that. <laughs> All of us sin. That's a reality. But we don't need to wallow within that. We are sinners by simply being human beings. If you're a human being, you will sin. And all of us are in the same boat, not meeting God's expectations. But the amazing thing is that not one of us is loved more or less by God than the other person. In the same way, by, that fact, by the fact you are a sinner because you are a human being, you are loved by God because you are a human being. God loved the Ninevites as much as he loved Ju uh, Jonah and the Israelites. And that was the shocker of this whole book. Remember that? God loves the Ninevites as much as he loves Jonah and the Israelites. God loves you as much as he loved Moses, as he loved the disciples, as he loved the Apostle Paul, as he loved Menno Simons. You are loved just as much. God loved Osama bin Laden as much as he loves you and all of these other names that we mentioned. I know that's odious to us. But God loves all human beings equally. God loves you. There is no question about that. But the question becomes, how will you receive this love and turn to God? The offer is on the table for all. The Ninevites received the same choice. And they chose to repent from their violent and evil ways. God loves you because you exist. Not because of what you do. So the question becomes, how will you respond to that unearned love? But all of this doesn't amount to much if we don't realize our own shortcomings. In Luke 7, 47, Jesus says, Those who have forgiven, been forgiven little wrong, love little. And then the reverse is the same. Those who have been forgiven much, love much. Now if you happen to think that God has simply pulled you off the ground because you have brought yourself this close and if anything, all you needed was a hand up these stairs to get to God, instead of being at the bottom of the ocean, puked out of the stomach of a whale, given new life, then indeed we have only the capacity to love little. That was Jonah. He didn't realize the seriousness of his own condition. He didn't realize the undeserved second chances God had given him over and over. And in turn then, he could not celebrate when the big city of Nineveh was entirely forgiven. When we see that we are given new life, all of us have a chance to give new life, the depth of that new life, where it, you, you were headed like Jonah was headed, that in 40 days we could have been destroyed and yet God changed his mind when we repented, our responses are great. And that's why we worship. Your job in worship is not to flatter me. Your job to worship is not even to make our recordings sound good when we sing old hymns. There is nothing you do here that makes any hill of beans difference about whether God loves you or not. You are here to respond to the fact that you have been pulled up from the belly of the whale. 
That in fact, 40 days from now, you could have been destroyed, but God changed his mind because he loves you and you have responded to this love and you have such great things to respond with. Amen? That's why you gather to worship. And if there's another reason you gather to worship, check that one at the door. Our response is to love a lot because we have been given a lot. And then to rejoice when we go out into the world and the Ninevehs and the Jonahs get second chances, even if they didn't deserve it. To celebrate, to be the ones that tell those stories, to be the one that gather them in, to be the one that simply put ourselves out there and let God work wonderful things through us. Amen? Amen. You are here Sunday after Sunday to give testimony to the fact that we have been given much and that we love much. And with this in mind then, I challenge you I challenge you this week to reflect deeply on three questions. Those questions, some of them are in your guide there. One is this. How are you allowing God's word to form you? Not relying on memories and thoughts and opinions, but the actual word of God, living and written. What are the things in your life that God wants you to urgently deal with, to repent from? to turn away from? And finally, what is God calling you to do in faith that you are reluctant to do? In all we do, may our lives mirror that of Jonah's prayer from the belly of the fish when he suddenly realizes it's not about him. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 9. It's at the front of your bulletin as well. I'd love to have us put this on our mirror as you wake up and see this, as you think about the bellies of the whales you're in. Jonah says this, in the midst of his own self-righteousness, when I had lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your temple, and I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, And I will fulfill my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Amen. Our next song is a song that many of you probably remember as a calling song. Just as I am, it is also Tina Epps' favorite song, and she sings this in various stages of her daily life's routine. And she... uh, Uh, asked us to sing this. We're going to sing verse 4 in a cappella. So verse 1 and then 3 through 6 with verse 4 in a cappella. Let's stand to sing (laughs) that.
out into what it, wherever it takes you this long weekend, I give you this blessing. Go into the world. Go out into the streets. Go out to your neighbors. Go find people you don't even know. Go out into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Return no person evil for evil. Reach out to those in need. And may the blessings and the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you always and every step of the way. Go in peace. Amen.